I'm going to share my screen. Um, would you be able to tell me if I'm sharing the right screen? Uh, am I, can you see the screen, Indu? Yes, we can. Okay, good. We can hear you clearly, also we can see you. Okay, thank you. Um, I just want to quickly get a bit of an idea on how many of the participants at this stage are PhD students and how many are um, kind of early career researchers. So if you could put your, raise your hands if you're a PhD, that'll be great. PhD candidate. Okay. Um, okay, one, two, three, yep, good. Um, others are early career, probably one or two, just to make sure that, um, Oh, that's great, thank you. Uh, well, thank you very much for this opportunity, as I said before, but I'm going to quickly go through some of the basic things about social science research. Um, I'm going to talk quite um, loosely without a structure, but I've got a PowerPoint slide to get us through, but it's going to be a conversation. I'm, I'm not going to give you what is quantitative research, what is qualitative research, uh, how it, it's all done. I am more interested in framing the social science research and making you understand the importance of getting a clear perspective of um, uh, social science uh, research methodology. So if I have, if some of you raise your hands or have any questions and if I have missed it, um, please Indu, um, let me know, uh, stop me halfway through, okay? So what I'm going to do is first to um, quickly give a structure, what is a PhD? Then what is social science research? And what are the philosophies we use in social science research? And then research reasoning. And, um, and in, in that process, I'll talk a little bit about quantitative, qualitative research, but I'm not going to go in depth about what is quantitative, what is qualitative, what are the techniques, um, because you can read them. There's quite a lot of YouTube videos. But where I see the problem in PhDs these days is that the framing bit of it. Uh, then I'll quickly talk about the, the need of um, reviews and uh, mixed methods, um, which is becoming very common, but how to frame it appropriately. And yeah, if I have time, then I'll talk about early career researcher journey and as a researcher, as a PhD researcher, how you should probably to get a job after you finish your PhD, what you have to develop as part of your PhD uh, to build your CV. Okay, So that is only if I have time. So. Question number one is what is a PhD? Okay. Um, we have all done a PhD, but if someone asks why are you doing a PhD and what's a PhD, it's a very difficult um, thing to articulate. Okay, so I've looked at some of the universities' uh, websites and I looked at some of the uh, I looked at the QS ranking uh, websites about uh, to designing what's a PhD. And what, what it means is that you're, if you're a PhD candidate, you are engaged in a pinnacle academic program. I mean, after a PhD, there are only one or two, one qualification to my knowledge is DSC that you could do. This is almost, you have come to a point of the top uh, educational uh, qualification that is available within the Western uh, education system. Does it make sense? So you are engaged in that. And it is all about, you presenting something that is extensive and original in the field uh, you, you are engaging in. So some of you may be in construction, um, you know, project management, some of you might be in sustainability, some of you might be in procurement, that's the key part. But I, I think the, the, one of the things that is making very clear is the definition about the research training and education. What, what is this process is doing is to train you and educate to be a good researcher and following up on to be a, um, you know, excellent academic or practitioner, and that, that's the job we are doing. So a lot of people think PhD is about doing some research, identifying some new things and submitting it a thesis, but it is much more that, that the research training is the key part. This is where the supervisors come in quite important because they are not there to only guide you with your research methodology and others, um, you know, kind of literature review, but they have to train you to be an academic. Okay, so um, in, in a way, the objective of producing, it's a whole object capacity that to conduct research independently. So once you do your PhD, the institutions that employs you, I'm, I'm, we are doing a lot of interviews now. We are recruiting um, a fairly um, um, junior level positions here, um, associate lecturers, lecturers, 
And what we are looking at is that what kind of training they have gone through and are they independent in the process of their PhD, what they have produced, what kind of capacities they have developed. So that is very important, okay? So part of it is research methodology. So I'm going to talk about research methodology, but I just want to let you know that is not the only thing you develop in your PhD, okay? So PhD, most of you would know it is uncovering new knowledge, discovering new facts, formulation of uh, you know those things into a document and submitting it. But I'm, I'm seeing that uh, as an academic in a, in a Western institution, they look at it quite differently. That is part of it, but it's more about your training, leadership, and you know, developing as an identity, as a researcher. Okay. Um, okay, so we come to academic research now because academic research is, is the uh, key component of a PhD. So it, it is about a studious, systematic, and a critical inquiry. So all of them are going to one thing, it is what is systematic, what is critical inquiry is research methodology and examination and discovery or an interpreting new knowledge. So the critical part of your PhD is about framing the research and having a methodology to go through that research to find new facts. Absolutely important. That's why we are going through this uh, session. Okay, very important. Uh, so the, the issue is that we th th there are a couple of things, you know, generalizing of knowledge and um, investigating some issues, and then not to do something that is very context specific, but then you should be able to take it to be a higher level. So if you have done a one single say, case study in Sri Lanka about a particular problem, what you have to do is you have to elevate it to a level that is applicable within certain parameters, um, helping others to understand the rest of the world. Those research are easy to publish. So when you're doing a PhD, very narrow, very context specific, and your uh, knowledge that you gather from that cannot be generalized, then it'll have limited uh, application, okay? So the initial steps, as you know, is scanning literature, okay? Then managing the scope, you know, you, once you start to read, you know, it, it'll be endless. And um, at least I could talk about one or two candidates I've been uh, working in, in moratorium, within the moratorium university. Uh, who are doing PhDs, sometimes, you know, we, we, we discuss how much literature we have to read and how, what is the scope of the project. Then you have to sense a domain and terrain that um, your PhD is uh, going to be um, used for, okay? And then you have to identify a research problem. That's a key thing. You spend a lot of time in identifying the research problem and then identifying a research gap, okay? Quite important. So what we are trying to say is that sometimes it's not a linear uh, issue. You know, you might have a problem and a gap, or you might have a gap and a problem. It doesn't matter which sequence you use. A lot of um, candidates, PhD candidates, wants a clear process outlined by the supervisors. PhDs are it's an organic, particularly in the social sciences, it's an organic um, thing. It, it just evolves, it develops, okay? And then you formulate your research question and formulate your research objectives, very important. Okay. And then we go on with the other, you know, other parts of it. So is, there, is, is research linear? Definitely not. How many of you think up to now, I don't know which stage of your PhD you are in, um, that you had a smooth run, you know, you did this, I did, uh, you know, sequentially you did things. Anyone? feels that that is not the way the PhD is going. You, you are, you know, curved balls. It is not a linear process. Can you raise your hands? Or you think it's going very linear? Okay, so uh, you, you feel that it is not going linear. Uh, Ilaksha, good, thanks. So that's the whole, yeah. And, and uh, into as well. Uh, I think that's a process, you know, it's a challenging process because it, it cannot be, um, you know, so said that you will do everything in a linear process, everything will come out. You will have frustration and challenges. It may be relatively easier to streamline the organization of research. We will say, okay, do the literature review first, then do the ethics application, construct a theoretical model, ethic application, then go and collect data. That organization process can be too linear, but the cognitive process, Okay. How do you do come up with arguments? How do you build your model? It's not a linear process. Okay. It cannot be characterized as linear. You will be confused. You, you will not show sure what to write where. You know? We have read a lot. So that is uh, something that we train you.
to get the process right and also the cognitive um, analytical processes uh, quite comprehensive um, development of that for you to come up as a good researcher. Okay? So thesis could, at the end of the day, when you write the thesis, you have to be quite, this is something I always reinforce. When you write the thesis, it has to be structured, it has to be written well, it should be linear in the way you have introduced the concept and the findings. However, your research process, the way you do it is messy, it's complicated. So what happens when you finish your PhD, when you're writing it, a lot of people try to write the way they were developing the PhD. No, if you do that, the researcher, the examiners wouldn't get it because you would have gone through many you know, mazes and then come up with the structure. So go back, think about it and write it in a linear way that people can understand. Clear objectives, clear processes. However, that is not the way you do the research. Okay? So that is very important. So a PhD, according to Michigan University, develops lots of things, okay? lots of things. So I would like to hear, um, I'm, I'm sure some, someone would be able to unmute and say, what, do you, what kind of skills do you think you're developing over a PhD? I can ask Indu because um, she's the convener. So do you think what kind of um, skills a PhD is developing? Any idea? Communication skills, analytical yep. skills, and cognitive thinking. Very good, thank you. Anyone else want to add to other, um, any other types of skills you think might be, uh, uh, you'll be developing? Because if you know you're developing, it will work on it, you know, otherwise you're not going to work on them. So it's very important that when you apply for a job after your PhD, people look for these jobs that you developed in the PhD. Anyone, anyone wants to add? I'll give two seconds, three seconds, otherwise I'll go on. Okay. So as you said, the first one is um, analytical and problem solving skills, okay? Defining a research problem, identify possible causes, you know, comprehend large amount of information, form, defend independent conclusions. So based on uh, most of your research now, you will know you have started doing it, okay? Um, design experimental pad models and everything. That's a very important skill set. Now, just to get an idea, how many of you are um, in the literature review process now? Just put the hands up. You, you haven't, okay. Um, any of you now gone to data collection stage? And yeah, any of you doing uh, analysis and writing? Okay. So a lot of people are yeah, in the analysis and writing stage. That's great. Um, so this is one skill set. What's the second skill set? Okay. The second skill set is about interpersonal skills, okay, leadership skills. I see some of the candidates really demonstrating that I've been in, in a lot of uh, what you call panels uh, a bit on as an external expert. Some of, some of the candidates show real interpersonal and leadership skills. Fa they can facilitate group discussions. They have demonstrated through research methodologies or through you know, um, engaging stakeholders, you know, motivate others to complete. You know, so so you, some of you might be teaching and that casual teaching or your teaching part comes that. In, in that way, motivating people to uh, engage in the research or be participants in the research. So that interpersonal leadership skills is quite important. The collaboration and uh, you know, um, teaching others as part of the process where you go to conferences, that's what you do. You run workshops, that's what you do, okay? The next one is project management and organization. This is a very important one. People who can do this very well, uh, generally does um, finish their PhD in time and develop good networks. The next one, research information, research and information management, very much about how to search databases, how to synthesize data, how to conduct surveys. And then um, as Indu said, communication. I can't overemphasize the communication bit. Whatever you do at the end of the day, you have to convince two examiners and rest of the world for impact, to demonstrate impact of your you have to communicate. You have to be able to write best abstracts. You have to be able to write um, you know, um, good conclusions, you need, you should be able to write good analysis. So that is a very important skill. I wasn't really good when I started with my PhD in my written and uh, my oral communication was okay, written communication. So my supervisor had to tell me to go and read books about best, best way to develop arguments to the point. 
Okay. So please work on it because journal articles, getting those um, uh, journal articles with minor revisions or even you know passing the desktop, the communication is important. Okay. Then finally, self-management and work habits, which we run a lot of workshops for our PhD students on that, you know, to be disciplined, to write, um, work under pressure and everything. However, today, um, my, my, I'll be focusing on this, this bit, uh, problem solving analysis and research management skills. This is the skill set we are going to talk about today. Okay? But it, um, don't underestimate the other ones. You can run other workshops. You know, we run a lot of workshops for communication, written and oral communications. Um, we have run workshops for self-management, as I said. We haven't run a lot of workshops on project management and organization, um, probably not on leadership skills, but we do run a lot on the other two. Okay. So that is something you should keep in mind when you go for jobs, um, apply for jobs, um, particularly in the Western societies, they look for these things. Okay. Now, coming to the topic, we talked about what is a PhD. Why, you know, why are you doing it is that you, know, you get esteem, you can secure jobs in certain organization, the skill sets you develop and PhD is all about research, but it is not only about research, you know, sorry, it's mostly about research, but it is not only about research. Okay. Now, so what is social science? I'm, I'm, I'm assuming some, how many of you consider your PhDs on the uh, realm of social science? Put your hands up, please. You think it's in the social science realm? So which realm do you think it's in? Technology? Okay. Um, management? Okay. I think uh, uh, most of the things that you have put hands up are social science. Uh, because economic management is form of a social science. Okay. Um, Economics is form of a social science. Political studies are social sciences. Unless you are doing things in lab, um, most of the things that involves human generally falls under social science. So social science are varied and it's, it's the interest of mankind, but they share fascination with human behavior and organizations. So if someone is doing procurement research, it is about organizations and human behavior. It's a social science research, okay? So it, it, what, what we are trying to do is those organizational systems um, and our understanding of human behavior evolve as we learn from the past and present. So if you're interviewing someone, what are you doing? You're interviewing human behavior. You, 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 want, to, you, you want to understand the human behavior, okay? So the, the simple thing here is that the disciplines that fall under, um, clearly under traditional discipline formed under social sciences, anthropology, economics, education, history, law, politics, sociology, psychology, management, you know, they haven't put management here, but management, all of them are the social science disciplines, okay? So you need to know specific methodologies that you would use for social science, okay? So if your PhD is about how do we live, so, or how do we organize, how do we believe, what is right and just, and who gets to decide, then most probably you're doing a social science PhD. Now, can you put your hands up if you believe that the, uh, the research question or your research study kind of aligns with one of these? Okay, so almost, no, all of you believe that um, it is about um, how we organize procurement, you know, how we organize technology or how we live, you know, in, in a society, urban societies. So this is relevant to you, okay? So your, does your research question meet into these broad questions? Yes, so we can proceed with this as a, um, you know, as something is relevant to you. So how might we make the world better, kinder and more just is the questions generally social scientists ask. So this is a question I always ask. Should the answer to a research question be same or not same, irrespective of who conducts the research? So say um, you and I are doing 
trying to address the same research question. Do you think the findings will be the same in, a, in the social science realm? Can you put your hands up? Anyone who believes that um, it might be the same or it could be different? Um, if you put the hands up, if it's the same. No, so anyone believes it's going to be different? Uh, it could be different, not it's going to be, it could be different. Okay. So if you, if you look at it, it, the reason for that is we use different philosophies, we can use different paradigms. So we may not end up with the same conclusion. So social sciences have that ability to look from different angles. So what we are going to do is that designing research methodology and looking at what is the methodology and the way of thinking about the social world and the realities the methodology. If any of you are thinking about the ways of thinking about studying a social reality, whether, whether as I said, technological implementation, innovation, uh, or any, any sorts of things, it, it is about way of thinking. And method, I want to distinguish them both. Method is a set of procedures and techniques for gathering and analyzing data. A lot of people think their method is their methodology. This is the first thing in social sciences or any good qualitative social science research you have to distinguish. There is a methodology. The methodology is the way you think about the social reality. Method is the tools and techniques used to collect. So if someone asks, oh, what is your methodology? They say, oh, interview or, or you know, Delphi study, or you know, I'm going to do survey. That is not, I would say, correct. It is a method. It's not a methodology. Okay. I would like to know. I mean, I don't know whether we can have the chat box open. Give me a minute. I'll, uh... So, can someone? Uh... Uh, do you want to put your titles here? What kind of research you are doing? And then I can have a look at it when I talk. Okay. So put your research titles or research, what kind of research you are doing so I could relate to it when I'm talking. Okay. So that's the first thing we are talking about. Okay. The second one, people talk about techniques. You know. They refer to way of attempting to completing research tasks, you know, data coding. So you use techniques within the methods. You, some people use different types of coding. Some people might use, uh, you know, software. Okay. Techniques, they do not themselves indicate which method is employed. You can do coding for um, you know, ethnographic interviews, phenomenological interviews. You can do coding for literature or published documents. So uh, it, it is a very important aspect of that, that you, techniques don't tell what method, method doesn't tell what methodology you're using, okay? Ways in which the techniques are applied will indicate the research method in application, but you know, if you say interviewing, I'm doing interviewing, it doesn't tell the method either in a, in a proper way. Uh, and also it doesn't tell about the methodology. So we're going to talk to talk a little bit about unpacking it in social sciences. Okay. So up here, uh, two topics I've heard, development, mobile collaboration in learning frameworks. That is completely a social science topic, uh, embedded um, cognition features in uh, table where ceramic designs. Yeah, that is a complete, um, early a, a social science because you're talking about you know, features of ceramic designs, but I hope that you're going to talk to people and understand how they, where they come from, uh, Dilshani. Okay. Um, so model to assess optimum water flow. Yep, that is also, um, you know, it, it has a very strong quantitative element and modeling, uh, but at the same time, it also has a qualitative element to understand where people start. Um, so, uh, philosophy of uh, flocking behavior in response to condition crowded social media. That's interesting. Yeah, that 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 has a technical component, but a social component uh, and usage connection between human emotion and usage. Yeah, uh, yeah. Implementation industry for technologies. That's pretty much about uh, you know uh, human behaviors within the stakeholders of adopting technology a classic social science research using understanding technology adoption, okay, and human behavior, brilliant. So now you got it now, we have got methodology, method and techniques, okay? So, um, so what I'm talking about is that 
when you are doing uh, social science research, it's multi-layered, complex. So I'm going to talk different things at different point in times. Then you need to put them together. That, that's, that's what I said, it can't be linear. Now, when someone does social science research, there, it can be quantitative and qualitative, okay? However, the credibility of the research is quite important. And, and the validity or what can I say, relevance, credibility, validity of the research is very important for you to um, publish. Okay. So where does this come from, this credibility of the research? First, some people are established researchers. They have published a lot. So if you say so and so, they will say, oh, yeah, credible researcher, you know, established researcher. But you are all emerging researchers. So you don't get yet there. I'm, I'm assuming you're not yet there without knowing your profile or making an assumption here. However, the next source of credibility comes from your supervisors. They generally ask, oh, so yeah, 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 they, they can train well and uh, there is a, they would have, uh, you know, wetted the research um, process. However, what is in your control is your problem conceptualization. Someone reads the paper, uh, reviewers read your paper and say, yeah, problem is appropriately conceptualized. It is not a flawed problem or it is not a problem that is not backed up by some uh, significance. First, credibility. Brilliant. The topic, the conceptualization is um, you know, very good. Then they look at the research methodology. If it's intact, it is relevant, it's going to answer the problem objectively or within the context of relevance, not, not uh, or the biases are acknowledged and the researcher has said these are the limitations. Brilliant, your second level of um, credibility. Then how you have validated their findings, not a quantitative language or how you have shown the, the findings are relevant and it's context specific, next level of credibility, okay? And then how you have used it to, um, um, for implementation or how you have synthesized how it be used. Some people stretch their findings too much. You know, it might be a credible findings, but they say, this finding can solve this, this, and this. And the, the reviewers come and say, no, this is too much of a stretch. You know? So the credibility comes from these things. So you have to always think in your thesis, have, is my problem credible? Is my methodology credible? Is my findings credible? Is my implications credible? Okay. So if you do that with a couple of papers and if you're with your research partners, then you'll be known. You know, academics are validated um, through your publications, through your public persona, you know, in, in many ways. Okay. So this is important. And research methodology is a very important part of credibility. Your findings are wrong if your methodology is not correct. Okay, your implications are wrong. Of course, the conceptualization is not part of the methodology. It's important that you conceptualize it properly. Okay. So how do you get this thing right? Um, you, you, you see, a lot of researchers have made mistakes. They have been pushed by commercial pressures. You know, there are a couple of integrity um, 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 investigations are going in leading universities in Australia, senior professors doing the wrong thing, falsification of data implications have been falsely, um, you know, exaggerated, okay? So why? Because there is power, politics, and ethics. So you need to step back and think to be a credible researcher before even we go into methodology. It's part of the methodology is that you have to know who you are, where you come from. You may have power, you may not have power. Your gender, your political views, your um, where you grew up, all of them influence a social science researcher, the way they see the world. And sometimes you use methodologies and you conceptualize problem in a skewed way. And this is where your credibility comes problematic, okay? So without the appreciation of how attributes of positions of power and privilege, I feel I might have some power and privilege within com certain communities. I go and talk to them. They always look at, uh, you know, look at us as people who are highly educated sometimes. And as I said, from universities, so there's an empowering imbalance. So sometimes it doesn't work well. And you sometimes totally wrongly conceptualize the problem because you didn't understand that your privilege and you're looking at from that angle, okay? So next one is your worldviews. Some of us are very much quantitative and positivist. We think there is an ultimate truth there. Some of us think, no, it is subjective. There are multiple realities. I might have an answer, someone else, 
would have, would look at the problem in the same way with a different answer or if they might see it differently you know this is where the gender and queer theory and all of them comes in because people don't see in the same way you know and in western world we use this word you know um people are very conscious about that um you know heterosexual uh, probably white and mainly uh, middle class have a particular stereotype the way they look at the world you know? and also now we are looking at indigenous research you know particularly aboriginal and torres strait islanders they they don't belong to the same they don't see the world that as we see we although we have been trained um, in asia we are trained in the western system from school education everything is uh, british system so i have been trained to look at the world with a western eye despite i'm not a westerner okay so it's very important you understand it because we now very carefully look at indigenous research as a different paradigm or, or a complementary paradigm rather than reject it okay so you need to make sure that to be credible you need to make sure that your power power privilege and world views don't misalign okay um so you fall into the trap of judging others with your own reality you you don't really solve the problem because you are going and looking at the community for example you go to a um community that is hit by landslides okay and they have um you know they they were living in very mediocre unsafe building uh, buildings uh, built by you know certain kind of practices we'll say or they didn't have the money to build it but we go and do the research and say no we need you all have to build houses with complying with codes with certain standards and you come up from your privilege point of view the money point of view have you think they can do that but that is not going to help you know you, you need to look for ways how we can really understand their point of departure okay very important so this is this is where sometimes the reviewers pick up the um the, the lack of um depth in the way you have dealt with your biases in forming the problem or solving the problem okay if you want to be a good social science researcher solve problems truly then you need to reflect day in and day out about what have i assumed here that i shouldn't have assumed as a researcher I, see, i i myself was a victim of this and i'm very careful now reflecting still i might not pick it up my team picks up and says the general i think this is coming from you're coming from this perspective probably doesn't apply here okay important i spend a bit of time on that because that's a critical part of building credibility is your ability to reflect and make sure that you're not um, um you know or stretching your power okay now the next one is all about understanding the relationship with your topic and you and the way the research is conceptualized first is ontology okay uh, social science research this is what where methodology comes you know there is number of methods that might go into these ontologies different methodologies first ontology is singular researchers use hypotheses and everything they think they can test prove something disprove something and there is a truth out there or the other one is there are multiple realities people work differently now most of you will have different stakeholders in your research you know architects construction managers or communities business all of them have different objectives they see the world differently uh, and you can't have a singular truth about something okay? people see everything differently so that is the first thing ontology so what is your method is your methodology belongs to a singular reality of the world or multiple reality of the world first question the second one is about where is your epistemology what is the relationship between the researcher you and what is being researched are you close to the topic or do you want to be a bit behind so it's about the philosophical roots of creating knowledge okay including different research reason okay so we'll talk about research reasoning later and uh, i know at least one or two of you using different research reasoning in this group very important so if you don't embed your research in an ontology and epistemology then probably your research credibility would be questioned okay the next one is axiology <laughs> what kind of values you are bringing in okay so i are, are you going to be totally unbiased you are going to be outside the research problem and analyzing like you know engineers do with concrete and how they design uh, steel structures no humans involved or 
you acknowledge there's going to be a certain level of biases. You know, if you go and do a study in, um, you know, a community in Kandy, poor, poor community in Kandy versus a poor community in uh, Hamantota or in uh, northern provinces, you have to understand the realities will be different. You know, they come from, they were grown up with different value systems probably. You know? uh, so you need to understand that the axiology. The next one is the methodology. You know? Do you collect quantitative or qualitative data or you want to mix them? Okay. So a lot of us only talk about quantitative, qualitative, but we don't embed them in an ontology, epistemology or axiology. Okay. So then finally, the rhetoric, what language you are using, very formal or informal. So these five things can influence three or four type of different um, um, research paradigms. Okay? So we define them like that. So the paradigms are positivism, constructivism, advocacy and participatory, and pragmatism. These are the five paradigms generally, uh, sorry, four paradigms are generally used. But these four paradigms can be very nicely distinguished based on the ontology, epistemology, methodological, axiology, and rhetoric interpretations. And if at the end of this session, if you could say which paradigm you're using, then your methodology will start to write about that paradigm's ontology, epistemology. It doesn't need to be more than a paragraph in a PhD or probably two pages. You don't need to harp on and explain, but you have to embed yourself to build the credibility from the reviewers and the examiners, where is your point of departure? Okay? You can't hide uh, without saying who you are and what do you, how do you see the world as a social science researcher? Very important. Okay? And that builds your identity. I, I, my, my boss here, my head of the school is an advocacy and participatory researcher. She wouldn't do positivism. She wouldn't do constructivism. She doesn't believe in it. And she's always been a very much of an activist. And I have for some time rejected that paradigm as research. Okay? And now I'm starting to realize certain topics can only be you know, explored through that paradigm. So we don't go with a methodology to solve a problem. We look at the problem. The problems she's working is more meaningfully solved through advocacy and uh, participatory paradigm. Okay. So very important, social science. Okay. So the positivism we are going to talk about is, you know, we, we, are more, we think we are mostly positivist. You know? Asian cultures like uh, objectivity. You know? we, we like um, rigor and validity. But most of the topics we study um, can't be in that paradigm. You know? If you're studying communities, you're studying people, studying them, then it has to be a constructivism. So let's look at the positivism. Mixed research methods mixes them. Okay, so you, but you need to clearly switch between these paradigms and not everyone has the brain to very quickly switch from a positivist paradigm to a constructivist paradigm because they are quite different, really the, the brain works. So in a team working in a big research project, the positivist and the uh, constructivist could be, um, you know, two different or positive is to construct really to understand the nuance and the differences. So the positive is, is that singular, singular, uh, singular paradigm and reality, there's only one reality, researchers reject to, or uh, fail to reject the hypothesis. You put a hypothesis, okay? You say um, um, the, uh, this particular structure would bend um, or crack at this particular strength. And then you go to the lab and do that. Similarly, in, in human science, also we do have hypotheses reject or um, accept, okay? It, it's a bit tricky in human science because there is some kind of constructivism in it, but we do have hypothesis testing theories, okay? It's generally the distance. We say we have nothing to do with the research. We are, we are outsiders. The statistical methods will prove or disprove. I'm not interpreting anything, okay? So there's impartiality. Researchers objectively collect data with instruments. And we call it, it's unbiased, but I'll question there's definitely biases in human surveys, okay? And deductive, so we are going to talk about deductive. That means you test prior theory, okay? And generally you write very formally. So some of you might do it as part of mixed research, but most of your topics, the way I look at it is constructivism. You accept multiple realities, designers, um, the, the architects, construction managers, quantity surveyors, 
uh, engineers. We all have different realities. Have you ever tried to make a conversation that you all come to the same conclusion? Very rarely. You know? Quantity surveys look at cost and we completely sometimes reject design. Uh, designers don't understand cost sometimes. You know? So it's, it's interesting. So studying construction management as a social phenomena is um, it's quite important. The industries have to understand that this is one of the most dominant paradigms. Okay. There, there are other versions of this, but I'm, I'm sticking to that, you know. So there's a closeness. Researchers visit the participants' sites, you interview, you collect data, and then you come back. And there's some level of biasness. Um, you, you, you know about it, and you probably put it in your limitation. There's a bit of bias here. Okay. Then it's inductive. It is not deductive. Now, we'll come to inductive and deductive later. Okay. Researchers, um, uh, you know, sit with participants. It says sit... Um, uh, participants and view the built up parameters and then you come back interpret it and build theories you're not testing theories you talk to them and you are giving some propositions uh, for future testing you're building theories generally there's a bit of an informal style of writing but um, it is not to use first person generally we don't we don't recommend first person style in construction management domain first person means not use i i i we use third person the next one is advocacy and participate. Very interesting. As I said, I didn't understand it adequately until probably last five years ago. It is a political reality. People who fight for um, uh, poverty, people who fight for discrimination, people who fight on the area of um, sexual um, um, or, or orientation. So people talk about um, uh, you know, indigeneity. That's political reality. Construction research doesn't really fall onto that. A lot of architecture research, research fall onto this advocacy participatory. A lot of disaster management research falls on the advocacy and participatory research. I have done a couple of advocacy and participatory research in Fiji and other places. Very enlightening. Here, there is no subject. In the epistemology is collaboration. You know, if you look at the epistemology in the previous one, there is closeness and distance, but this is collaboration. You work with the participant. They are core part of the study okay so we went to a community in fiji we lived with them on the whole day you know not not in their village but we went to hotel came back morning evening we sat with them um, we, we talked to them and extremely biased and negotiated with them about the interpretations how they see that and the, the methodology is participatory uh, they are part of it and then we do the rhetoric is advocacy. We want to go to the government and tell these are the issues these communities are facing. We want to influence policy through that. <coughs> you can in influence policy through objective and uh, deductive, sorry, uh, the, the other paradigms, positive and constructive. It's, but this is the voices. This has a different flavor to the findings. Okay. Finally, you mix them. Uh, multiple or singular realities. You can have uh, practicality. You know, you might. Um, have a part of the research singularity and the other one is constructive some advocacy. You bring them together and combine. That is mixed research will come last. Any questions to date? Up to now? Okay. So we talked about this methodology as being embedded. Okay. Um, a very important one. The next one is, sorry, stopped. I talked about inductive and uh, deductive reasoning. The positivism is deductive reasoning. The other one is inductive reasoning. It's very important you understand what it is because now you will realize the credibility of a research comes from how you build this reasoning in your methodology. Okay? So reasoning is the ability to think logically and to formulate a fair judgment and justify a position. Okay? You have to justify your position in your methodology if you couldn't. Now, I spend a lot of time with uh, one or two candidates here about you know, getting that justification. And sometimes I even go and ask others, you know, senior members or fairly established and reputed researchers, is this justification making sense? Am, am I being reasonable in this reasoning? Okay. So you, that's where your experts in your PhD or you go to your supervisors or supervisors might go and ask someone else. Very important. In other words, it's about identifying, analyzing and evaluating your arguments in a particular frame. Okay. So we used deductive reasoning in the positivist paradigm. We used inductive reasoning in the constructivist paradigm. Okay. So keep it in your mind. Is it all okay? Uh, can you put in the chat box if you're okay or if you want any clarifications? Okay. 
So we are coming to deductive reasoning. Okay. Um, it's an interesting one. I, I would like to really get your views on this, where you belong in, in this, um, in, in your journey and the, up, up to now, whether you have done your methodology, you have done your research, where, where your research belongs, okay? On the chat box. The deductive research follows a conscious direction from general law to a specific case. What it means is you read, there are theories, theory of information management or theory of information maturity or information deficit, many theories, you know, theory of motivation. Then you use that theory, that law is established and you are going to specifically try it in a particular case. Deductive approach is the most suitable for testing existing theories. If you want to test Maslow's uh, theory of motivation, you go to Sri Lanka or its particular context and you want to do quantitative study, test hypothesis that it works, that is deductive. And deductive research and its positivism, okay, in, in the paradigm. The deductive research scans theory, particularly to literature review. This is why literature is absolutely important. You can't ignore literature review in any research. We'll come back to that later, okay. Diverse logical conclusions from the theory and presence in a form of hypothesis or proposition. You test them with uh, quantitatively and present general conclusions and either reject, falsify, or accept and the hypothesis. And that's the logical sequence. Okay. So what happens in a deductive research is that the, you start from a theory. You have to have a theoretical framework from prior literature. You have to build up conclusions from the theory, you have a conclusion, theoretical conclusion, saying this is the hypothesis. And that conclusion is tested. You know, H0, H1, null hypothesis and alternative hypothesis, you test it. And your final conclusion says, corroborating with your theory or abandoning the theory. The Maslow's theory doesn't work in Sri Lanka or work for uh, garment factories or construction workers, but it works with that. Does it make sense? That deductive research, you came up with a framework, and you had conclusions from that frame, uh, theory and framework that you wanted to test further. Okay. Does it make sense? Because it, it's applied, it's a theory. Okay. So you're, you're looking for a context specific case to apply and study. That is falls clearly under positivist paradigm. Okay. Now we are going to inductive reason. That's what I would assume most of you would be doing here. But anyway, we'll leave it for now. Uh, I'll let you judge later. Inductive research approach reasoning through moving from a specific case or a collection of observation to general law, okay? That's facts to theory. So inductive research approach is more suitable for developing new theories. There's no theory. What you're trying to do is you're going to talk to people, get facts and build them, synthesize and come up with a theory, okay? So, Inductive logic flows the opposite path of deductive, I should have put it there. Not generally, you don't do literature, you can do down the theory, which I don't recommend, but you need to have literature to understand what has happened in that area, but there's no theory in that area or no clear rules in that area. So what you do is that you go observe, you do a case, you look at the results, you establish the rules. Okay, so the, the path there is that you are, developing proposition, you are developing rules from a case result. On the, the previous one, it is from rule to case to results, the, the bottom one, okay? So you have a rule, sorry, I'll probably highlight it for you so it makes. So the deductive is there's a rule, established theory. Then you take it to a case, test it, and there's a result. But in your um, deduct inductive reasoning, there's a case you study uh, and you result and you come up with rules. This is where we have to be careful in selecting the cases we want to study or the areas we want to study. Because if the results cannot lead to a generate rule and the cases are so different, and if its credibility cannot be held because there isn't enough sampling of your work or enough um, subjects you didn't study, then it falls apart. Okay. So, it follows this path. You have theoretical, you existing theoretical knowledge from prior research, then you take that and explore further real life observations. Then you come and give a theoretical conclusion, a framework. 
This can be taken to deductive later on to test for context specific cases. Does it make sense? Okay. Right. Now we are going to introduce a third one. Okay. That's it's been there for some time, but it's not a very common pattern of reasoning we have used. Okay. The third one is abductive uh, reasoning. Okay. So abductive reasoning is a case that presents a plausible but not logically necessary conclusion. This is a bit of a confusing area. Huh? That means you can't come up with everything with theory to test. Okay? At the same time, um, you need to make sure that there should be um, some kind of data to help to develop the framework. But however, then you need to make sure that that data is not enough either to fully complete. So you need to go back and look at the theory again, bring something in, put together. So it is in between the inductive and abduct, um, um, uh, what do you call um, deductive. So read it carefully. Abductive reasoning is the case presents a possible but not logically necessary conclusion, okay? Provided that the anticipated rule is correct. So you, you start with the rule, but you know you, you don't know, it's not completely true. So how do you deal with that? You know? So an empirical event or phenomenon is, is related to the rule. So you take that rule, then you're going and studying empirically, you get new insights, then you have to go back and look at the literature. Can I fit some other theory to explain it? And then you come up with some conclusions. Okay? So that's abductive. Here, you have a rule, to resolve to case. So it is very different. So you have a rule, then you go and find results around that rule, put together, then you make a case. You don't start with a case, okay? So if you look at it this way, there is prior knowledge, then you go use that to real life observations. Then you go and look for, is there any other theory I can bring and explain it? Come back to uh, again, look at real life observations. And then you create theoretical propositions with mix matching everything, prior knowledge, this new theory, then you come to application, okay? This is a different kind of a paradigm that's emerging, but it's a complicated paradigm. It's easier to either you do deductive or inductive. Now I would like to hear from you, which paradigm do you think your research falls under? Please put it on the chat box so I would, it'll help me too. Inductive, deductive, or um, abductive. Okay, Elshan Yu is inductive. Timutu, inductive. Hindu. Anyone else? Or oh, you're not sure yet? Inductive. Inductive, yeah. Okay, good. Uh, because this means after you have an ontology and everything set it up, you are going to clearly tell them, this is how I'm going to do the research so that when they read it, your credibility of your approach becomes clear. So inductive is you have a general theoretical knowledge, then you come together and put them together and then um, uh, do some qualitative data analysis and qualitative interpretative analysis take it to the theoretical propositions, okay? So, sorry, this slide shouldn't be here. So I should forgot to delete it. Anyway, so reasoning in a nutshell, you've got abductive, deductive, and inductive. You start abductive with incomplete observations, then do the best prediction. Deductive is there's a general rule, specific conclusion, always true, but abductive reasoning may be true. Same with inductive reasoning. Specific observation, the general conclusion may be true, may not be true, depending on the context. Does it make sense? This is why some cultures like deductive reasoning, it's always true, but we don't live in a world that, in the social world is not always like that. It is not like science. It is always true that if you mix these chemicals, this comes out. We humans don't work like that, okay? Are you good? Okay. So this is where I've talked about a little bit of quantitative, qualitative um, methods uh, beyond that I'm not going. So once you decide your paradigm, whether it's constructivist or positivist, then you decide the reasoning and within um, constructivist, you can do um, 
abductive reasoning paradigm, okay? Um, or you can do inductive paradigm, okay? However, when you're mi using mixed research, you will have deductive and inductive together or abductive as part of it as embedded design. We'll talk about it later. So when you're designing a research methodology for your um, uh, PhD or for your research, you need to ensure first selecting a methodology worldview, okay? the ontology of the world, positivism, constructivism, interpretativism, critical theory, hermeneutics and emancipation, critical realism, pragmatism, so many paradigms, worldviews are there. Okay? So you need to find the right one that would fit with your approach. Then you have to have a methodology with the worldview, case study, ethnography, action research. And this might shift between certain um, certain researchers might put it as worldview, some people might put it as a method, but it doesn't matter, you know, as long as it's clearly embedding and clearly aligned to answer the question, your methodology, okay? So, uh, ethnography, action research, grounded theory, phenomenology, ethnomethodology, discourse analysis, semiotics, these are selecting a methodology or strategy. Then you come to your method, surveys, observation interviews diaries focus groups you know artifacts observation you know looking at artifacts you know indigenous research is all about looking at the artifacts and interpreting them visual video textual all of them are methods then you come to techniques are you doing coding descriptive statistical inferences are you doing spss to do a parametric analysis regression analysis that's a technique or you're using coding are you using uh, you know conversation analysis thematic analysis Okay, you, you would have a flow here from constructivism to action research to observation interviews to coding. That makes sense. Positivism, ethnography, uh, observation. No, that's completely wrong. Positivism is very clear. You go for surveys or some kind of formal data and you do statistics. Okay, so sometimes the alignment of the methodology, the worldview methodology and strategy could be completely wrong. So you need to get it right in your nar narrative the way you write, okay? So what we are talking here is that now that literature review is very important part of your research. So we talked about social science methodologies and everything. Now we are bring, going to bring that literature or theory that we talked about your need for abductive, inductive, or deductive. You go first for this thing. You, you basically go for what has happened before, what, what is there. You can't do a research that's saying, ignoring everything that happened before. Um, Indu, what, how, how am I traveling for time? How much time I have left? Half an hour or 45 minutes? Uh, so it's uh, 3.45 from Sri Lanka time now. Yeah. Uh, we can take another half an hour for, for the talk oh. and then maybe 15 minutes to... That's fine. So I'll, I'll target. Uh, I think I should be finished by half an hour. So, so what's the goal of the literature review? Um, and first thing the examiners look for in a PhD is how good is the literature review? How comprehensive it? If you have submitted journal articles, there's one item always. Is the literature complete? Have anything been missed? Okay. So it's very important. But there are two types of literature review now evolving. Okay. So the literature review is an account of what has been published by on a topic and um, by accredited scholars and researchers <clears throat> and call about, you know, some people do annotated bibliography, just basically put them together, okay? So the next one is to demonstrate the familiarity of body of knowledge and establish credibility. People, examiners don't like someone just ignoring critical work that has been done past in the past and you're trying to redo it. It's a waste of time of, and resources, and it's a disrespect for the people who have done the work before. Does it make sense? So literature review needs to be thorough. Um, so what literature review does, it demonstrate the familiarity of the body of knowledge, establish credibility, and tells the reader that the researcher knows the research in the area, and he, know, he or she knows who are the key people in that area, who, what are the centers, or what are the countries dominating this discourse, okay? to uh, show the path of prior research, how a current project is linked to that, very important. So although this is, th th this is important, the way you frame your reasoning 
in social sciences. Okay, so you need to understand what methods the others have used. Uh, and you have to, in a literature review, look at that also, the methodologies used in those literature review. And this is a typical thrown, thrown slide, you know, these are the sources of literature, all of you would know that, but some of them are highly credible literature or reliable literature. Some of them you have to have um, extra vetting to make sure, so for example, trade magazines or newspapers um, and sometimes corporate reports could be, even government reports could have a political chain. Okay. Generally, we believe journal articles and books are fairly peer reviewed um, with the str very stringent processes, so they should be okay. Websites, blogs, dissertation, you have to be very careful. Okay. So now we, are, we talk about two types of literature review. You know, when we go to journal article publication, they ask, have you done a systematic review or a, a narrative or traditional review? Both are important. But it's hard to these days to publish a literature review that is traditional as a literature review without primary data. People expect a systematic review. So what is the difference? The narrative review or traditional review is takes variety of styles, variety of tones. You do a story. You know, everyone tells a story in the article, but this is pretty much about storytelling. There's no defined methods. There's no specific analysis. The way you connect these articles, the way you want to tell the story is as narrative style. Uh, opposed to that, the systematic review has a structured process. How many years of literature are you looking at? What are the keywords you are going to use? Um, you know, how many papers are relevant that you think based on the parameters that you have defined? Then you, these, there's a rigorous method like that. Then you have to synthesize that very carefully, how, what approach, how you have to code it, bring them together. Okay, so that's systematic literature review. Now, when you're doing a PhD, most of you do a narrative review, probably to find a gap and establish everything um, as a problem. But some of you might do a systematic literature review, but it sometimes gets tricky to incorporate into the PhD systematic literature review. But I will leave it to you. But what I'm trying to say is that um, there are two types of methods. And in the traditional one, you do a narrative and inductive, but if you want to a deductive, that means a reason testing hypothesis and testing the hypothesis of existing data, you have to do systematic. You can do chronological literature review, looking at from 1900s, what happened to construction evolution or what happened to labor movement, you know, construction labor movement, uh, how, how did the subcontracting evolve? That's a chronological one. Cause and effect is the other one. So th there are three or four types of literature. Generally, PhDs have an inductive or narrative style literature review. Okay, does it make sense? Okay. So why literature is important? Because you can't start your research without literature in social sciences. First, you have to have a background. It's based, it's embedded in literature. Your research gap significance is embedded in literature. Um, and then research settings, your objectives and gaps and everything is comes from literature. Your theoretical framework comes from literature, whether it's abductive, deductive, or uh, inductive comes from literature. Finally, you get the research methodology comes from literature. The only thing in the PhD that literature doesn't come in, your data collection phase and data analysis phase. You purely use the data to tell a story. Then with those analysis results, you bring in literature again for discussion. So literature is critical. Okay? You need to read and be Sure, and abductive become very important. After you do the data analysis, you back to the literature, look at the theories, come back, put them together, and then uh, you know go back again, do that cycle until you come up with a theoretical proposition. Okay. So <clears throat> the traditional view is often based on personal selection. I've, I've published one or two articles on traditional review. I can't imagine I would be able to do that um, any further. Um, and um, it, it's because people are very skeptical, the biases in traditional literature review, which I would disagree. You know, good lit traditional literature review is highly insightful and it's highly cognitively challenging, okay? Because there's no process. You need to tell a story that is convincing reading all the articles, okay? So often based on the personal selection of materials because of, you know, writer beliefs, original authors have some important contribution to the current knowledge. So. Uh, when I wrote my cultural analysis um, theoretical paper, I, I was bringing in different perspectives to do the analysis, what I believed uh, rather than what 
the systematic review would have done in terms of a process. Okay. Uh, writer weaves in contribution together in a logical, systematic way, but um, you know, logical and systematic way to tell a story. Um, and there's no process to that. And there's a lot of reflection there. And the, the issue is that it could create a one-sided argument. Okay. So it's kind of good reviews, traditional reviews have, will have some quality assurance process. Systematic review is as opposite. It, uh, it generally used to identify gaps. Um, it is seen as neutral. There's a technical process. You can do software um, like uh, Voss Viewer to get clusters with the literature and you know, look at the connection between keywords and demonstrating an objectively and transparent process to the reader. So there's no biases or there's few biases or less biases. Okay, so that's systematic. Now I'm not talking today about how to do a systematic review because we won't have time, but you would probably um, you know, go and read more about it if you want to do a systematic review. There are quite a lot of books on it. Okay? So what I always tell the early PhD students is that don't confuse between getting a fully organized uh, literature review, organizing literature review versus the cognitive side of the literature review. A lot of the people come up with table of contents even before doing the literature review. That's wrong. Because first you need to find the sources. You need to keep records of them, you know, summarize each paper. You can't have headings because you have to create headings. You organize your ideas in that. And all of them you could do with some process. But however, how do you connect them? What we found is reflective, getting the big picture. Everything is a cognitive ability. Okay? Some people can write beautiful literature review because they connect arguments very nicely through literature, no primary data. I sometimes struggle to write that um, the organization right to connect things because English as a second language, <laughs> sometimes I don't get the right words to express the connections, but you shouldn't fear. You have to think outside the box, connect ideas and bring a theoretical framework for empirical analysis, okay? <laughs> so always when you are reading a good literature review, people will find there's an aim, a question for that literature review or a clear objective. And you read with the purpose, you write with the purpose and make sure that you've got everything clearly done. There are two types of literature review I generally say. Model one, if you're going to write a paper, you, know, you, have, you do an introduction with the literature review, then you do a key arguments, then you have a research methodology. This is only literature review based papers, okay? Not, not a, if you're writing PhD uh, papers based on your PhD. Then you come up with framework proposition, you conclude. There's no testing. This is where inductive research will end. Okay? The inductive research is basically, you look at the things, bring together, use a research methodology, create a framework and more. The second model is a bit different. You know? Here, what we do is you test with existing data. For example, let's take a, it's positive, it's generally, let's look at a uh, cancer research. Thousands of thousands of articles are there for decades published. So you do an induction, you have a theoretical framework, you create the hypothesis, you go and find the results of other studies, do a data analysis and prove something that is right or wrong. So this is a different type of literature review. You can, the data comes from literature or published sources, okay? So that's how it works. So two types of literature review. Now we are coming closer to the mixed research methodology towards the end. So we talked about the philosophy, paradigms, reasoning, all sorts of things. Now, if you want to mix it, how can you do that? And most of you might um, consider at one point would have considered a mixed research methodology. So for many years, researchers have collected quantitative and qualitative data, but they haven't put them together in a systematic way. Okay? They do two separate things and they report them separately. Mixed method research involves collecting both, you know, quantitative and qualitative data, analyzing them separately or in, in a way, so pretty much separately. Then you looked at look, how to bring them together and answer a bigger research question. Okay. So um, 
you do surveys for quantitative, you do interview for qualitative, um, generally open-ended ones, quantitative is more close-ended, okay? So once you collect, you analyze, you know, with quantitative data analysis, like uh, regression analysis or correlation analysis or fact analysis, then you do qualitative data and code it and come up with some propositions. Um, you have two sets of studies. How they interact with each other is key for mixed research in social sciences. So we say there's an aim question, there's a research instrument characterized by the method or methodology, then you come to the findings, very simple. However, it can be informed by quantitative, that research instrument characterized for qualitative, okay? So what we are looking at here is that the, the qualitative, uh, quantitative research looks at objective reality, use statistical tools or instrument, Generally, researchers are removed from the subject. The instrument are tools, that statistical software. Qualitative is different. Researchers become the instrument. You are the instrument. So you have to be reflective uh, to make sure that you, the biases are minimized and you are not taking your particular bias stance in interpreting the results. Researchers get close to the subjects. Okay? So when you bring them together, then it's called mixed research methods. So how would you bring them together is the question, okay? So a couple of designs, convergent parallel design or explanatory sequential design or exploratory, uh, sorry, there's something come up. Uh, you can still hear me, right? Yes, sir. Yeah, okay. Exploratory sequential design, embedded design, or multi-phase design. Okay, so let's look at the first one, convergent design. This is what I have used mostly. Uh, so you collect <laughs> quantitative and qualitative data parallelly at the same time. Okay, so when I was looking at cultural influences in uh, construction project organization for technology, I did a survey with people not from the case study organization somewhere else. About 300 surveys came back, and then I did six case studies with qualitative. Then I brought them, compared, contrasted, and kind of synthesized them, integrated and interpreted them together, and come up with an interpretation. Okay, so that is convergent parallel design. Sometimes when PhDs are very tight with time, that you you have only one year to six seven months to collect data, probably this works well. The, Explanatory sequential design is that first you do the quantitative data analysis and then you follow up with the qualitative one. So you do a big survey and one, one of my PhD students did that. He did a massive survey and he got um, results with um, quantitative ones and he prone hypothesis and then he wanted to see how that particular hypothesis works in a community. So go, went, Develop small stories, then explain, interpreted it, how it works. But one of the common things people have done in the past is exploratory sequential design, exploratory sequential design. First, you do some interviews because there is no enough knowledge within the literature to develop a questionnaire. Then you analyze it, come up with key themes, then builds to a quantitative, qualitative, and then interpretation. You look at that, builds to, and follow up with okay, key ones. The embedded design is a bit tricky. You do quant qual, and then within that, then you extract something and do another quant qual, uh, and before, during, and after kind of analysis within the same thing, quantitative and qualitative. So it is it is not sequential really, but it is embedded within the other. Okay. Finally, multiple stage design. Most probably, um, abductive reasoning researchers might end up somewhere there. You know, you do a quantitative, then qualitative, then you do a mixed research after that. Okay, does it make sense? So there are challenges and opportunities. You know, placing research methodology ahead of a research problem and vice versa. So people sometimes have a methodology and so on. They are not looking at the research problem and the right methodology, but they look at the other way around. Um, and also uh, with emerging quantitative and qualitative mix, uh, it's difficult to research researchers to establish validity in a traditional sense. So you need to write very clearly to the journal uh, viewers that how you maintain that validity, credibility of the research. 
and also give flexibility to generate novel research approaches, you know, but it's an opportunity. So what happens in construction area? It's flexible. It, you know, we were fairly seen as a positive paradigm for a very long time. And then people started to question, we are not a social science discipline and positive approaches limits our thinking. Okay. So it enabled researchers to be liberated from strong attached to positive uh, uh, or con um, constructive paradigm. Now you could do a mixed one. Researchers need to be aware of their predispositions. Reflexivity is very important. You need to know who you are and why you chose that particular position. And you need to tell your philosophical position in your research. Uh, also, it will enable study soft informal matters. You know, a lot of the things cannot be studied formally. You can't people won't want to do questionnaires or interviews sometimes. You know, you have to have informal approaches, like um, say that um, uh, black market or sorry, uh, the the uh, informal labor in construction, you know, people who have not documented, they are not paying taxes, you know, you can't, um, you know, do for positivist research. You had to have informal, uh, you had to approach them with sensitivity. Okay? And then with time, uh, research uh, using mixed research methods can provide sensible solutions to industry problems. Okay. So that's good. I'll, I'll probably stop there. Um, and questions, and if there aren't any questions, I might go to the ECR a bit. Um, so let's look at some questions here. Uh, what um, place does the grounded theory methodology get in today's research world? Yeah, I, I, I think it's hard. Grounded theory comes at places where you could you you don't want to be influenced by prior theory, but you want to really talk to people and generate new theory and new insights, which is going to be very hard because we have developed centuries of knowledge and um, very rarely grounded theory gets published, uh, except some in some places. Say that you want to understand indigenous construction methods. How indigenous people um, have lived, uh, or traditional methods of construction. There isn't documented literature. So, grounded theory works. You go, you sit, you talk to them, then you categorize them, you develop all the quotes, synthesize, come up with something. So, where there is no existing um, clear knowledge established, grounded theory works. Okay? But most of the research we do have significant amount of prior knowledge. Uh, and prior theories or prior data. So grounded theory doesn't work very well. Okay. Um, what else? Um, you, even if you say COVID is new, I want to do a grounded theory, but pandemics are not new. You know, COVID is part of pandemic. So if you're going to manage things like in that, it might be harder to even justify. So I sometimes struggle to find um, exact, you know, very valid reason to do a grounded theory. And PhDs, I sometimes discourage grounded theory because you are missing the whole part of literature review that is a research training part of it. Um, uh, you know, most of the time you won't be able to publish uh, without a good literature review. Okay. Um, so, that, what is the other question? So, uh, grounded theory. So, what is the best method? Uh, to test emotional uh, test you know, to observe people react with uh, products while <laughs> I, I think people have used videos and uh, visual analysis um, and it, it has codes um, I'm not an expert in that methodology but I worked with the design academic um, years ago and what they did was they inter I mean it's intrusive in a way uh, video analysis and what point in time uh, and how long these uh, emotions are coming and then facial expressions then followed up with the uh, um, followed up with interviews um, and or focus groups about their emotions and collaborate whether the time stamped observations they had in the video uh, was kind of reflecting what people were kind of uh, expressing what they're doing so I, I would say it's a visual and a um, um, uh, what you call a uh, vocal or voice based you know, uh, interview based analysis. Does it make sense? Um, the other one people look at is psychology. Uh, so if you are, if you don't want to do visual and interview, then psychologists have um, um, 
question is that um, trig measures uh, triggered emotions that people um, feel when they look at a product. So I would go to the psychology discipline that will become fairly quantitative, okay? Um, because it's it's a, it's it's trying to. I wouldn't say positivist. It's a positivist, but it it may have still can reflect a bit different in reality. So video analysis or a interview to collaborate it or go for purely a cognitive based analysis uh, with psychological tools. So this is where your social science method comes in. How would you best weave them in for an argument of credibility that you have really looked at the true emotions of people? The other one is sensory ones. You know, people put um, heartbeat. Um, it's very intrusive. And uh, you, they, you introduce and you look at the heartbeat, the um, you know, nerve sensors to look at how people um, react to a product. Okay? So that is more neuroscience-based approach with uh, cognitive testings. The other one is psychology-based approach with questionnaires. Um, the, the interviews will be an inductive approach with an anthropological cultural view. And the observation is also would be an uh, you know, anthropological cultural view kind of an approach. So, you might be able to do things differently. Okay, does it make sense? Please let me know uh, if I'm answered. Uh, does quantitative uh, qualitative research always involve with people? No, probably not. You know, I mean, if you are if you are going to analyze text uh, of um, newspaper articles, it can still be qualitative. Uh, it doesn't need to involve humans. Uh, uh, or you, you can be a self-ethnographer, you can reflect your own emotions and it becomes or your own experiences, it's qualitative. So that involves you as a person, but not others. But you textual analysis and um, you know newspaper analysis, archival analysis, all of them are qualitative, doesn't involve people. Okay. Uh, when uh, writing qualitative uh, and mixed research patterns, the peer review comments can be quite demanding to address as reviewers tend to request additional justification. Any general suggestions strengthening the methodology is this type of research. Yep, okay. So as I said, if they think it is tokenism, you have used mixed research, they will pick it up, okay? So what I'm trying to say is that um, in mixed research, sometimes one is dominant than the other. You might have a quantitative study with 30 people, um, questionnaires answered and, uh, you know, 30 interviews. So you, your quantitative is quite weak. If you have 300 questionnaires, it's valid in its own right and it stands on its own and you've got 30 interviews mixing together is great. So if you want to use mixed methodology, you have to say you need two, re, you, two paradigms to really understand the problem you're studying. Okay? Qualitative is, you know, it's, it's easier to justify than mixed research methods because if your problem is an inductive problem, okay? It needs inductive reasoning. There's no way you can do a deductive uh, research. So, so the, what, where they become sensitive is that you haven't put a philosophy, your number of subjects, the case study is not clear why you are studying it. You haven't reasoned it adequately is where the problem becomes, okay? So the research question decides what methodology you use, then make the argument that the methodological choice, the methodology, method and the technical choice is reasonable to it's the best to answer the research question then you won't have a problem unless you have got a specific um, question that is my generic answer to that that your credibility you say i've done interviews of 30 people why you did those interviews what type of interviews did what type of questions were used is the one they want to know okay the credibility okay uh, yep, triangulation is basically, you know, you can do three case studies, bring them together, or you can use two or three methods and bring them together and making sure that the results done in three separate uh, um, uh, processes, through th three separate processes or three separate subjects or three separate um, uh, uh, techniques come together to make sure there is a lot of collaboration. Okay, it doesn't conflict with each other. So that when it's triangulated, they think that the results is more valid and more, more credible, okay, rather than one study. So you do a case, you do three case studies, okay, and you might do uh, uh, questionnaire and interviews. 
So three ways to triangulate is that you have these three case studies and with each other observe, or you do all the three questionnaire surveys, qualitative surveys and observations, come up with the findings and put together. So there are many ways you could build your triangulation, but it is building confidence in, uh, in, in your research outputs. Okay. Uh, Okay, what is it? Next one is uh, the physiological side is most probably, um, you know, observation is the best way to go. Do we need to acknowledge the potential biases of a research and quality? You have to be very careful with that because I remember one of my PhD students wrote a hell of a lot about his biases and I said, well, <laughs> the examiner would see that as this completely incredible research. Um, I think you have to be aware of it. You don't need to. Uh, uh, expose all of your biases because if you know there were biases you should have dealt with it to a certain extent to minimize the biases but you could put certain limitations you know the number of case studies or the, the things that you were unable to do but sometimes you are an inside researcher who understand or you are an outside researcher so I would be cautious in terms of um, putting a lot of biases yourself biases based for the sake of writing it um, I wouldn't put it, but what I would do is that to get the research right and people not picking up in your analysis, in your language, the biases, I would be careful to avoid those biases through reflection, not to, you know, expose them all the time. Okay, so for example, if I use I, I, me, me, and then a men language, uh, you know, positivist male language, you know, he, 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 sometimes people say there's no gender neutrality. I had a view about a particular gender. So you have to reflect on them and change them rather than, you know, always say, um, you know, you have a lot of biases, okay. Uh, but some people say, you know, I'm a, a male with uh, this certain middle-aged background and uh, I'm looking at these things from that problem. Some people might say that, but very, I rarely come with, uh, with such biases uh, openly acknowledged. Okay, theoretical framework and conceptual framework are similar. Okay. Theoretical framework sometimes is, um, I think the slightest difference will be, it could be quite robust and uh, it, it could lead to hypothesis, whereas conceptual framework could be a little bit lighter and it, it brings the concepts together and it's more qualitative. Theoretical framework sounds a bit quantitative, but technically both come from literature for inductive and deductive research and only abductive doesn't have it that far developed you know it's incomplete uh, but for inductive and uh, deductive they have to be fairly complete within those parameters okay any other questions so as long as you clearly i mean, I mean what i do with my mixed research methods i use the theoretical framework for quantitative side of uh, and i used a conceptual framework for qualitative because it was loose a couple ideas that i had to explore and generate theory any other questions? Okay, Indu, we have got a bit of time, is it? Or uh, did I miss? We are actually running out of time, sir. Okay. Um, yeah. We had to finish up now, is it? Someone now, is it? Uh, yeah, thank you very much, sir, for That's sharing your you. thoughts. Um, and I would like to thank all of those who are presented here today. Uh, I invite you all to join the main room for the talk on developing high impact journal publications that, that will be conducted at 4.30 p.m. This session is conducted by Professor Paul Shan from Delft University of Technology in Netherlands. Uh, the meeting link will be posted in the chat box here. Uh, thank you again, sir. Uh, thank you very much. Oh, all it, of you. it was really great. You know, if you have any questions, please let me know. I'll send the slides to you. Uh, and. Uh, uh, I'll put my email address someone has asked me and yeah thank you very much and uh, enjoy Paul Chan's one um, because he, he you know it's one of the very difficult journals to publish uh, and if you could get some good tips and particularly he will talk about case studies and inductive and uh, you know those things and I've watched one of his presentation sorry I'll send the uh, Indu has my email address or Indu might be able to tell you. 
Okay, good luck, all of you with your PhDs. Uh, you can reach out to me if you have any questions. Otherwise, have a great evening. See you in the, see you all. Have a great evening, sir. Thank mm -hmm. you.